You are listening to Ideas and Leaders podcast. I'm Elena Paventa, Executive Communication Coach and TEDx Organizer. With each episode, I'll share with you communication tips and ideas from top business leaders to help you excel in your career. Welcome to the next episode of Ideas and Leaders podcast. Today, my guest is Ed Everts. He's a book author, he's a leadership coach, and he's a business strategist. And recently, Ed released his new book, which is called Drive Your Career. It is an amazing analogy of uh, uh, people driving their career, stepping into this driving seat and setting their own path for success. I really love it. So uh, I would love to speak with Ed today in this episode. Hi, Ed. It's great to have you on Ideas and Leaders. Thank you, Elena. It is great to be here. So, Ed, why, why did you decide to write this book, Drive Your Career? What was your main motivation? Well, I have been a leadership coach for about 12 years, and I began to notice uh, just organically that there were stories I would tell people on a regular basis, regardless of who they were. So whether they were a president or a supervisor, or whether they were in manufacturing or pharmaceutical engineering or legal, you know, wherever they might be, there were experiences that were very, very consistent. And so as I started to observe this storytelling or behavioral uh, analytics we were doing, you know, I began to notice that there were some of them that were repeated, right? That these were the similar stories telling similar people. So I had probably what might be one of those shower moments where I said, you know what, I should write these down and I should share these with the world. And so the outcome is the book, Drive Your Career. Uh, nine high impact ways to take responsibility for your own success. And I use those words specifically because you do need to be the driver of your career. There is no knight who is going to ride in on a white horse to save the day that you have to know what you want to do. You have to know where you want to go. And there are certain behaviors that you should think about in order to get there. And so the book essentially are nine behaviors that you should think about doing in order to be more of a driver of your career. Perfect, perfect. I really love this this analogy of uh, I can see myself sitting in the uh, driver's seat uh, in uh, of my career and and uh, uh, those nine tips that you're providing in your book. Let's cover some of those uh, in in this episode. I for example, I really love that you open your book with this concept of, of building good relationships with your boss. And I know that many people have issues with this. So what would be your advice? What can we do? How can we build those good relationships? And why, why should we do this? Well, you know, I'm not a statistician, but I would tell you that in hindsight, when I look uh, at the relationships that I've had with all of my clients over the last 12 years, you know, I would say easily 85% of them believe that they could have a more positive relationship with their boss. And I don't mean be best friends and, you know, go out and have margaritas on a Friday night, but, you know, it could be more positive that if someone was to ask their boss about them, you know, they think that it could be a little bit more positively said and that they might be viewed more positively with their boss. So this is such an important behavior for leaders who are looking to be more of a driver because your boss is the entrance to your next opportunity. You know, if anybody wants to hire you or think about you within your organization, they're gonna to go to your boss and say, hey, what's it like to work with Ed? How is he as a leader, et cetera? And you wanna ensure that what that boss has to say is positive. So uh, for those people who are thinking about or believe that they could have a more positive relationship with your boss, you know, there's a couple of things I think that you can do. One is uh, be transparent with your boss and say, hey, I think our relationship could be a little bit better than it is today. Even if it's okay, I think it could be a little bit better. And I'd love to talk with you a little bit more about things I can do and things that you can do a little bit differently to be more effective. Now that might sound scary for some folks to have that type of conversation with their boss, but oftentimes when you kind of break that ice and talk about things that I'm willing to do a little bit differently, 
and also that you might be willing to do a little bit differently. It can help elevate you in their eyes in respect to your capabilities to be an effective leader. A second idea, Elena, might be that folks should be interested in what their boss's goals and objectives are. You know, we're so focused on ourselves at work that we don't have time to think about what other people's objectives and goals might be. And so uh, again, finding time to sit with your boss and say, hey, uh, you know, what are you attempting to achieve in your career? You know, what are your goals and objectives? What do you want to be doing in five years? And then of course, part two of the conversation is how can I help? You know, I'd love to help you elevate your role in the organization, or I'd love to help you kick off that big project. You know, how can I help? Bosses like people on their team who are helping. You know, if I were a boss, I'd want to know that everybody who worked for me were rowing in the same direction and helping us move as opposed to not being that way. And so why not be transparent with your boss and ensure that you have that type of relationship with them? So I didn't put the nine behaviors in order. You know, I think they're all equally important. Although I would tell you, I did start purposely with have a positive relationship with your boss because I think that's such an important behavior. Yeah, yeah, this sounds a bit tough, but when you think about it, I think it's really important to have this conversation. And uh, it, it also inspired me to have a couple of uh, such uh, more, more meaningful conversations uh, with people I work with. So thank you very much for that. And, yeah, uh, and I would just, yep. just mention very quickly, uh, you know, for all of our listeners, it would be important to before you have this conversation, just think about, you know, what's one or two things I could be doing differently to have a better relationship with my boss. It all starts with you. It doesn't always start with somebody else and wishing they would be different, but what am I going to do differently in order to have a better relationship with my boss? You've already started to do that yourself. And I think that's just a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. So start with yourself and you're, you, you're also saying in your book to, um, you're, you're speaking about the value of spending time thinking about yourself. So why do you think this, this is important and why, why should we do this? You know, this is such a fascinating behavior because this is something so few people do. And yet, as I've worked with clients and, you know, part of coaching is you, right? Uh, you know, one of the things I love about coaching is that the subject matter is you, right? The only person we're talking about is you and what you could be doing differently to be more effective. And I don't think you need a coach to do that. And so this behavior of really finding time, whether it's monthly or quarterly or twice a year to uh, you know, put yourself in a conference room or if you're working virtually, your home office and thinking about how am I doing? What do I need to do a little bit differently to be more effective? What are the opportunities that are in front of me? You know, really thinking with yourself. You know, nobody knows you better than you, Elena, uh, whether it's a spouse or a parent or brother or a sister, they all know you, but nobody knows you better than you. And you know all of the experiences you've had, you know all of the good things that have happened, all the bad things that have happened, all the things that have happened that you've not told anyone about, right? So nobody knows you better than you. And what better person to sit back and think about how you could be doing things a little bit differently to be more effective. And so, you know, finding time to think about yourself so that you ensure that you are being that driver and not a passenger is a great behavior to help ensure that you're taking the right next steps to make progress. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And uh, even on Ideas and Leaders podcast, we had one of the episodes which uh, was called great leadership starts with self-leadership, that in order to be a great leader, we need to start thinking about ourselves, our own behaviors, analyze our own behaviors. So this is so, so important. And um, um, Ed, you, you also mentioned in your book about being curious. And uh, it is, um, I think that th this uh, can be a little bit uh, controversial in the business environment because you know in the business environment we want to uh, be and to sound and to look professional to show that we know everything but you're saying be the most curious person in the room so what what do you mean by that 
Well, I actually think that curiosity is a significant leadership skill. And in fact, if you read articles or listen to interviews of huge, uh, important leaders across the globe, they will oftentimes tell you that they're not the expert in what they do, that they have surrounded themselves with people who are the experts. They call themselves employees who are there to help ensure that the mission is achieved and that we're all moving in the right direction. So curiosity is really a effort to understand where somebody else is coming from before you share where you're coming from. So one of my favorite quotes is from Stephen Covey and his, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, habit number five is seek first to understand, then to be understood. And this is such an opposite behavior, as you said, to what happens in most organizations. We have been raised from high school and junior high and high school and college to be expected to always know the answer, right? We study so that we always know the answer. And we've become a world where we seek first to be understood. And then if we have time, I'll try to understand where you're coming from, right? But I'm always ready to tell you what I'm thinking or what I've experienced. And more effectively, it's important for you to first be curious about the other person's perspective. Why do you think that? You know, where is that thought coming from? What have you experienced that led you to that conclusion? Because the more I can gain uh, about what you're thinking, the better my interaction is going to be because now I know more about what it is that we're talking about and why you feel the way that you feel. So for all of our listeners, I would stress to think about, you know, how can I demonstrate curiosity and ensure that I fully understand exactly what somebody else is thinking before I weigh in with my opinion. And sometimes, and I certainly hope that my opinion might get modified a little bit because now that I understand more about where you're coming from, we can have a better outcome. Yeah, absolutely. I think that this paradigm shift from knowing everything to asking a lot of questions is very important. And when we just realize that we are, uh, I love the quote, when, uh, when you are the smartest person in the room, then you are in the wrong room. <laughs> so <laughs> I just right. love it. And I think that you, what you say, being the uh, most curious person, surround yourself by experts and to ask them a lot of questions. This is what makes you a truly great leader and makes you drive your career further. And you're also saying about help and support from your colleagues. So how, how can our colleagues support us in our career journey? Well, this is a highly underutilized effort on the part of more, most corporate leaders, because again, we're so focused on our own goals and objectives. I'm not saying that we operate in silos, but oftentimes we create these silos where it's all about me, 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 and not about others that I work with uh, or others in my network. So certainly uh, over the last year with the pandemic and even really since 2008, 2009, there's been this greater effort and focus on something called networking. And so uh, this is a belief based on the experiences that I've had with clients that they're more likely to be successful with more people in on whatever it is that they're working on. That it's not just all about you, but it's all about us. And so how do I ensure that I'm bringing other people into my journey? And if I am driving my car, of course, there's seats for everyone, right? Or if I'm driving a bus, there's seats for everyone. But how do I bring more people in to help me. And oftentimes colleagues, especially if you're new to a role or new to an organization, colleagues are people who have been there for a while. And so you want to find somebody. And in the book, I talk about some of the criteria that you want to look for to identify a good mentor or a good colleague. But colleagues are people who have been there. And so they know about relationships. They know about personality behavior. They know about what we've tried before that didn't work, et cetera. So tapping into those resources can help escalate your efforts as a contributor in your organization. And you mentioned a very important thing in, in my opinion, having a good mentor, because I think that when we are planning our careers, when we are in this driver's seat, we cannot get there by ourselves. Yes, we need support, 
of our colleagues, our peers, our boss, but also having mentors, someone who already went through this and now can help us and support us. It is so important. So what, what would you recommend for to, to our listeners? What to do uh, to, to find a good mentor and what are the criteria of a good mentor? And when we see, when we know this, that, that this person could be a great mentor, how can we approach this person? Well, some organizations have mentorship programs. And so you definitely want to explore your organization to see if they have mentorship programs. You know, finding the right mentor uh, is not easy. And it's not because they're not out there. It's because the mentor needs to understand what his or her responsibility is. You know, it's not just to be there for you whenever you want to talk but it's there to ensure that they're observant of you and can give you feedback on what they're observing of you. It's important for them to identify the two or three, not many, it could even be one area of interest you wanna work on. So it might be career development, it might be communication, it might be delegation, You know, whatever it is that you wanna get better at, you wanna ensure that they are aware of that so that they can help you focus it. You also need to talk to people, You know, it's not a, you know, uh, like a dating app that the first person you meet, you fall in love with and get married, right? Sometimes you just might not connect with that person and you want to talk to different people. And lastly, Elena, it doesn't have to be a business person. It could be a family member. Uh, it could be a neighborhood member, right? What it, you need it to be is somebody who really understands what you're about, how you're driving your career and what you want to achieve and can help you get there. If you can find a person who can help you, they will make a fantastic mentor. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and uh, we need we need to have those people to to give us feedback and to be kind of uh, our mirror to because very often we don't do not see our own maybe mistakes or uh, typical behaviors that keep repeating and that stop us from achieving the next level. So absolutely having a mentor is, is crucial. What I see uh, is that people often have this barrier of approaching mentors, because usually the person who is, who is uh, the, a good mentor for me is a person who is uh, one level higher, who already went through this journey uh, of, of uh, the, the, this career development. Maybe it is a CEO, maybe it is a top manager. And I, I might feel that, oh, I don't know how to approach this person. I don't know what they would say. And I have this fear of rejection. So what would you recommend in this case, how to approach such a, such a mentor, prospective mentor? Right. Well, I agree with you that this is a huge roadblock for a lot of people. And ironically, 95% of the time, not always, but a significant proportion of the time, mentors are flattered to be asked because we love talking about ourselves and what we've experienced and why we've experienced it and what we did about it. And so if there's somebody else who wants to learn from that, that I can share and influence, I would love to do that. So, you know, it might be sending them an email, introducing yourself and talking a little bit about your objectives and goals and how you'd like to work with them. That's a little bit of a softer approach because uh, most of my clients, when they have done that with a more senior leader, uh, have gotten a favorable outcome. And it's something like a, you know, a quick little absolutely would love to, right? Not a long dissertation, but yeah, let's get together. I would love to do that. So I think an email is a great way to make it. If you want to be a little bit bolder, you can go knock on someone's office door and ask for a few minutes and tell them that you would love to talk with them a little bit about mentorship. Uh, you know, maybe another piece of advice might be not to ask them to be a mentor, but to talk to them about mentorship for purposes of seeing if it might be something they're interested in, right? So you're putting in a little bit of a transitional step. So you're not coming in and saying, hey, Elena, I want you to be my mentor, but hey, I'd love to talk to you about mentorship. And then also see if this might be something that you might be interested in. If you're not, that's totally cool, but it starts with a conversation. Yeah, perfect. Great tips. Thank you so much. So uh, you in your book, you're speaking about feedback. And I think that uh, it is it is a great point that we need to provide uh, constructive feedback 
and, and receive constructive feedback, but very often in business environment, feedback is associated with something negative that we are kind of afraid of feedback. Okay, now they are going to criticize me. So what, what, what is your tip on providing constructive feedback in the business environment? How do you see this? Well, I, I, first of all, I agree with you that if somebody walked up to you and said, I wanted to give you some feedback, you probably could feel just the energy in your body drain because you believe what they're about to do is criticize you for something that they recently experienced. So, you know, good feedback starts first with a good relationship. If you and I have a great relationship, I'm open to telling you things that you're doing well and why I think you're doing it well, and also things you could be doing differently and how you can do them differently. So I'm not judging you based on what you did good or bad. I don't like those words. I like the word difference, right? Because if you can do something differently, that means that there are other ways of doing it that would be more productive. And quite frankly, if you had some observations of me of things you feel I could be doing differently to be more effective, it's like, bring it on, right? I'd want to know and I'd want to hear it. Unfortunately, what's happened in most corporations around the globe is we have performance assessment processes. And what's been created there is this you know, feeling of uh, get, you know, getting feedback in a very structured way. So the clients that I work with and feedback systems, of course, are under great challenge over the last decade. Uh, we've seen that they don't work. You know, we gave them 40 to 50 years of trying to improve performance and we see that they don't work. And so what we're trying to shift to is a more conversational relationship where multiple times during the year, we'll sit down and I'll share, and first of all, to seek first to understand and be understood, I'd wanna hear from you. What do you think you're doing well? And what do you think you could be doing differently to be more effective? And I'd expect answers in both of those categories. And then I'd share with you things that I think you're doing well and things that I think you could be doing differently to be more effective. And we do this multiple times. So it eliminates a lot of the surprise. It eliminates a lot of the drama where we're waiting until that day at some point during the year while I get my performance review and find out if I'm a 4.6 out of five and so forth and so on. So, you know, I think, uh, Elena, to answer your question, it starts with relationships. It starts with ensuring that people trust you as a leader and that you're having a more conversational experience regarding performance versus a process experience. Yeah, absolutely. This is a, this is a great point. And uh, in fact, feedback is so important, but because of those performance review process, we kind of changed our, uh, our perception on <laughs> perspective on, on uh, giving and receiving feedback a little bit. But uh, yeah, it is, it is so important to have constructive feedback. Um, and uh, Ed, you're speaking about empathy in, in the workplace. Sometimes we, we might perceive that uh, being empathetic in, in business environment, it can be a sign of weakness because we need to be strong leaders. And why, why do you think that it is important to show empathy in business and what, what benefits can it uh, give us? Well, I think empathy is strong. So I think it's a fantastic leadership strategy. We've talked about a couple today uh, that I think people should think about because this is really the decade where I believe these behaviors are going to become more and more dominant. Curiosity, uh, listening, and empathy are three kind of softer approaches for leaders where they're not in charge and dominating and taking over, but they're listening really well. They're very curious about what they're experiencing and they are demonstrating empathy. So in today's world, there are so many things going on and it's so important for leaders in an effort to build relationships when somebody is not themselves or something has happened that might be putting them into a different place is to demonstrate empathy. And empathy is all about you putting yourself where they are versus you expecting them to be where you are. And so if it's a Monday morning and you and I work together and I observe or note that you're behaving a little bit differently, I want to demonstrate empathy with you and say, hey, Elena, what's going on? You don't seem to be yourself today. Oh, I had a really bad weekend. Well, if you'd like someone to talk about with it, you know, I'd be happy to talk with you about it. You know it, it might be good to talk to you about it, right? So it's creating a place where you make progress because if somebody has an issue that is weighing them down, it's affecting productivity, 
it's affecting engagement, it can bring other people down, right? So you want to address it. So, you know, I think demonstrating empathy is a extremely strong and effective leadership style for leaders at all levels, because it does help people break through whatever it is that they're experiencing. And it could just be the conversation that helps, or you might decide, you know what, it sounds like you're having a really tough day. Look, with full pay, don't worry about it. Why don't you take today off? Uh, go home, rest, relax, and why don't you come back tomorrow? Who knows what the answers might be, but you know it provides you an opportunity to do something that can help another person as well as help yourself as a leader. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so uh, to sum up our conversation, uh, we, we heard so many tips. Uh, what, how would you sum up what is the most important for leaders right now in order to, to drive their career? What should we focus on? So we were discussing relationships and, and listening and being empathetic. How would you, uh, if you were to say in, 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 in few sentences, what should leaders do in the current environment and in the current business environment? What would it be? Well, I think the one thing a leader could do is work to build their self-awareness. So leadership is complicated. You know, we've talked about a few behaviors today. There are many, many others. So uh, ensuring that you are self-aware on how others experience you in the workplace helps you self-manage more effectively. So you should be thinking about and figuring out how you can build your self-awareness on how others experience you. Maybe the organization you work for has a 360 tool where you can go out and collect feedback from others on how they're experiencing you. You could schedule meetings with people to talk about the fact that you wanna build your leadership presence and wanna collect feedback from them on things that you could be doing differently to be more effective. Whatever it is that you do, now is the time if you wanna be more of a driver of your career is to understand that you know how people experience you so you can self-manage those behaviors more effectively. I definitely recommend to our listeners to read the book by Ed Everts, Drive Your Career, Nine High Impact Ways to Take Responsibility for Your Own Success. Uh, this You will find their information about the points that we discussed today and many, many more. And Ed, how can our listeners contact you? They want to ask additional questions. The best way to contact me is to go to my website, which is excellius.com. That's E-X-C-E-L-L-I-U-S.com. Uh, there's a lot of information there. There's the information about this book, as well as my first book, Raise Your Visibility and Value, as well as contact information for me, Elena. Perfect. I will put those information under our episode so that our listeners can get on your website and contact you. And thank you so much, Ed, for being with us today. Thank you. It's been a great conversation, Elena. Thank you for listening to Ideas and Leaders podcast. Did you enjoy this episode? Let me know that you listened by tagging me in your LinkedIn profile and using a hashtag Ideas and Leaders. See you in the next episode.